Thank you, Terry, and, and welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's not often that we get to engage in a dialogue that brings research, poly policy development, and practice together in such a uh, potentially powerful kind of way. So uh, thank you all for knocking my sheet onto the floor. <laughs> thank you all for, for coming and, and participating in this with us uh, today. Um, sometimes in the academy, research that is called applied research receives second shrift in terms of the credit that it is give, accorded. And yet when we talk about an issue like bullying and cyberbullying and its connection to the workforce, there are a few things that could be more powerful than research that shines a light on our own practices and develops and informs policy that can guide and shape uh, ethical conduct within a group setting. That notion of applying what we know to the development of policy is something that I think in the academy we need to take a stronger stand on. I think we need to take a stronger stand on that within our institutions and more broadly. A colleague of mine from the East in reflecting on how uh, governments, uh, both provincial and federal across this country, are increasingly moving towards an era of policy-informed evidence, suggests that we need to reverse that trend again and go back to evidence-informed policy. That we should be looking at the data that we get and using that to actively and, and uh, vocally argue uh, for the implementation of what we're finding within policy structures. It's also interesting, I think, uh, for academics to ask, well, where are we shining the light? The easiest thing for us to do is to study someone else. Right? So we can use that ethnographic method and, and observe the behavior of others and make all kinds of nice comments. But the ability to shine the light on our own practices, and our own policy, on our own place, is much more difficult. And so again, I really welcome this kind of a dialogue uh, to get us to start doing that, because that's so, so very important. Um, I'd actually like to leave you with, um, with two thoughts. One's kind of a perspective that I take on this, and one's kind of a challenge that I uh, would put before you. Uh, the perspective that I take is that bullying of any form uh, only occurs in a vacuum of social responsibility. And uh, I, was, I was greatly informed in some of these thoughts by a researcher from University of British Columbia. His name's Ishu Ishiyama. I don't know if anybody's read his work. Uh, he immigrated to, to Canada, to Montreal, from Japan at a young age, and encountered racism firsthand at McGill University, where the structures and the practices didn't necessarily reflect the attitudes that the university espoused to be true. And he devised what he called anti-racism training. In looking at the impacts of bullying and racism being a highly specialized form of, of bullying, uh, he noted that what we tend to do is provide intervention services for victims. So once you've been the victim of a bully, how do you move on with life? And if we catch the bully, we provide interventions for them. How can you engage in better behaviors? But that rarely solves the problem. Those are coping mechanisms that are working only at the individual level. In his words, the only way that we make a difference is if we train the observers, the witnesses, to the events, and encourage and empower the witnesses to take a socially responsible stand to say this kind of behavior is not acceptable. And so I would encourage you to think in your dialogue today about how we, as witnesses, can inform this argument. What is our responsibility when we see things, and how can we exercise that? The challenge that I would like to leave with you, as if that's not enough, um, is that we have to be really careful when we invent and develop policies and practices to imagine the abuse of those policies themselves and how those policies may be used by bullies. Because nobody is more sophisticated at understanding complex systems than the clever bully. That is how they get away with things. Right? They know how to use every bit of policy. So I think we have to be cautious uh, in our, and I'm speaking mostly to the academics, although I recognize that this is a, a, an interesting gathering um, 
but I want to speak to the academics just a bit. Some of the worst abuses that I have seen in my academic career have been by people who espouse the virtues of social responsibility and social justice, but then go around treating people like clerks and secretaries as if they're dirt. They take on a position of privilege and think that there's an entitlement. And essentially, bullying is an abuse of power. It's a, an abuse of a privilege of power. And so we have to be very cautious of how we present even findings that we know to be true and real from our own research and how we communicate those in ways that are respectful. And I think this notion of a dialogue is a really powerful way to do that. Um, so I think the idea of bringing together research and policy and frontline staff is just Terry, it's a brilliant idea. So I'm really happy to have been uh, part of the support to, to bring this in. Um, the hope here is that we'll create some momentum that will continue research about understanding these notions of, of bullying and cyberbullying, that we'll be able to engage in policy development that is respectful and that does guide practice. Because when policy is good, as one of my colleagues says, policy is your friend. And when policy is not good, it itself is a bully. So how do we think and engage in this whole process? I encourage you to engage in the dialogue, to not just sit back and listen, but to use those mic buttons and to participate in it, because when we all participate, we all become witnesses. Thank you.